Greetings, folks. I'm Rod Machado. It's my nature to try and make connections between things. For instance, when the family of four teenage boys next door gets an electric hedge clipper over the weekend, and on Monday the neighborhood cat suddenly shows up with a new haircut, I think, hmm, color me a skeptic, but I think there could be a connection here. So here's what I want you to do. Take a look at this picture. It's a picture of a Stinson panel, and notice where the mixture control is. That's right. It's in the full, rich position. Now watch this video of the same four-place, 165 horsepower Stinson with four people on board attempt to take off from Bruce Meadows Airport in Idaho at a density altitude of 9,100 feet. And don't worry, no one gets seriously hurt in this video. Oh, they do get roughed up a bit, but I'll walk away from this crash. Let me say this for the record. This is a terrible way to install a pine-scented air freshener in the cockpit of your airplane. It appears that the pilot did not lean the mixture prior to departure, resulting in the airplane's engine developing less than its maximum potential power for the conditions present at the time. So the question is, how should you lean a normally aspirated engine for departure under high density altitude conditions? And to find out, we need to understand the relationship between engine power and heat. You see, airplane engines were designed to run at sea level under standard conditions without your having to do much of anything to the mixture control. In these conditions, the typical airplane engine gets all the fuel it needs along with all the oxygen necessary to burn that fuel properly. For the most part, you just can't pump too much fuel into the engine at sea level. Why? Because at density altitudes below 4,000 feet, your typical airplane engine can develop 75% or more of its maximum rated power. Now, at or above 75% power, the engine develops a lot of heat, and it counts on cool fuel entering its combustion chambers to help cool the engine. And this is why all engines have something known as a fuel enrichment valve, which allows approximately 15% more fuel to flow into the engine than is needed for normal combustion when the throttle is moved to its full forward or takeoff position. And this throttle position is typically the last one-fifth of forward throttle travel. Fuel enrichment works just fine as long as you are departing at density altitudes less than 4,000 feet. At higher density altitudes, where the engine can't develop more than 75% power, you don't need fuel enrichment for takeoff. <laughs> As a result, if you don't lean the mixture for takeoff at higher density altitudes, the excessively rich mixture will dramatically reduce your engine's performance. Think tree freshener time. So here's the rule. And keep in mind that this is a generalization, but it works pretty well for the typical general aviation airplane. You don't lean the mixture when your engine will develop 75% or more power. Now, how do you know when your engine will produce more than 75% power? Well, you look at your performance charts. In the example above, with a 9,000 foot plus density altitude, the 165 horsepower Stinson engine is probably, if properly leaned, is probably producing 60-65% of its rated power. Since detonation rarely occurs below power levels of 70%, there's little chance of detonation. So the pilot should have leaned the mixture for takeoff, especially since the Stinson's fuel enrichment valve is pumping an extra 15% of fuel into the carburetor's throat with the throttle in its full forward position. So the question is, how do you lean the mixture for takeoff from a high density altitude airport? In other words, an airport with a density altitude above 4,000 feet. Well, in an airplane with a normally aspirated engine having a fixed pitch propeller, the best way to lean for takeoff is to do a full throttle run up in the run up area and lean for maximum engine RPM followed by a slight enrichment of the mixture to ensure that you're on the rich side of peak. In other words, not too lean. Then you reduce power slowly, ensuring that the engine doesn't stall. And sometimes you might have to keep the engine RPM up a bit uh, just prior to takeoff. Uh, to keep the engine from stalling because of the lean mixture setting. 
and then you take off the mixture in this position. Now, on climb out, you can make small adjustments in the mixture to give you maximum RPM. Why? Well, during a, during a static engine run-up in the run-up area, the engine just can't achieve its maximum RPM because there's no windmilling effect on the prop as there is during takeoff. Therefore, there will be a slight increase in power on takeoff, possibly necessitating a slight adjustment to the mixture during climb-out. Now, in an airplane having a constant speed propeller, you can't use engine RPM as a means of gauging max power development. Therefore, you typically have four distinct methods for setting the mixture for departure from a high density altitude airport in these type of aircraft. Number one, you can do a full throttle run up and lean the mixture until the engine sounds like it's developing maximum power. And you can also do this while holding in position for takeoff too. Then you reduce power, take the runway and depart with this mixture setting. On climb out, you can make small adjustments in the mixture to produce max power by sound. Now, as an aside, I have to admit that sitting on the runway, adjusting power makes me a little anxious. It makes me feel about as uncomfortable as a Border Patrol agent at a Cinco de Mayo festival. So, this isn't my favorite method for leaning at a high density altitude airport for departure. Number two, if you have a multi-cylinder graphic engine monitor, you can do a full throttle run-up in the run-up area and lean for max EGT, then increase the mixture slightly by about 75 to 125 degrees Fahrenheit for your best power condition. And keep in mind, you're using the first cylinder to reach peak EGT as your temperature reference, not the last cylinder. Then you reduce the takeoff, the power for takeoff, and if it pleases you, uh, you take the runway and make small adjustments in mixture on climb out to produce maximum power. Once again, we're doing this with an engine that's developing less than 75% of its rated power. Number three, if your airplane has a fuel flow gauge, you can lean to the value recommended for takeoff under specific density altitude conditions, and you'll check your POH for details. The last choice is not my favorite, and hey, that's why it's last. You can leave the mixture lean for taxi, as I'm sure you'll do during taxi to prevent plug fouling, and make your mixture adjustment during the takeoff roll. If you can handle the distraction, and the runway isn't too short, of course, this is a perfectly viable method of leaning. One reason I might use this strategy is if the run-up area or runway had rocks, peb pebbles, or any other detritus lingering in the area. You see, props will suck up these things like a vacuum cleaner, and it'll cause a lot of damage to your propeller if you're not careful. And keep in mind, your objective on takeoff is to produce the maximum amount of power possible without harming your engine as a result of detonation. Once again, it's very rare for detonation to occur at power settings of 70% or less. And detonation is typically associated with big bore, high compression engines, but it certainly can occur in smaller four-cylinder engines too. Finally, as a general caveat, check your POH to make sure that uh, the technique you're using does comport with the manufacturer's recommendation. Thank you so much for uh, tuning in. I've been Rob Machado. It's been a pleasure having you. Greetings folks, let me tell you about a new e-learning program that will help prepare you for your flight review by providing you with an up-to-date understanding of essential aviation regulations and aerospace knowledge. Now, as you know, you're required to take a flight review every 24 calendar months. And the review requires you to fly with an instructor for at least one hour and have at least one hour of ground review on Part 91 of the Federal Aviation Regulations. Okay, flying is the easy part for most pilots. It's the ground review of the regulations that often makes us feel as if our mental wheel stopped spinning because our mental hamster just died. Well, it's simply boring, and most of us would prefer throwing ourselves in front of an onrushing glacier, opting for a slow death, instead of having to spend even one more minute reading a sentence in a rule book. Well, if you're like me, and I know I am, then I know how you feel. So, here's how I can help you. First, let's agree that it's very important for you to understand aviation regulations. There's no getting around this and don't even try, can't do it, uh-uh. It's also important to understand that you don't wait until a day before your flight review to bring your regulation knowledge up to acceptable standards either. So keep in mind that things have changed over the years. 
For instance, if you own an airplane, you're required to renew your registration certificate every three years. Say what? Get out. No, it's true. And it's best that you know these things. To help you learn and refresh your knowledge in these areas, I've combined two interactive e-learning courses that cover Part 61, Airman Certification and Currency Requirements, Part 91, General Operating and Flight Rules, as well as rules and techniques for operating in many different types of airspace. Now, the exciting part about the Flight Review course is that it's fun to use. There, I said it. I used the word fun while speaking about regulations, and that wasn't by accident either. You'll find learning the regulations using my method to be particularly enjoyable. Why? Because this course contains animations, videos, and various forms of an interactivity that engage you and maintain your interest. Now, just imagine telling your spouse that you can't do home chores because you want to study Federal Aviation Regulations. That's right. He or she is going to think that you're actually planning to run off to the airport and go flying. But that's not what's going to happen because you are actually going to study the regulations and airspace along with it, and it's going to be a fun thing to do. So keep in mind that airspace is part of our aviation regulation block. You need to have a comprehensive understanding of airspace rules and procedures, and that's what this course also provides. It provides you with the reasons why our airspace system is constructed the way it is. And I can assure you that you'll learn important things in this course about airspace that you will not learn anywhere else, and that's a fact. Yes, your flight review might not be oh, scheduled for a while, but there's no better time to brush up in your knowledge of airspace and regulations and maintain that knowledge at a very high level. The least this course will do for you, I suppose, is give you bragging rights over how much you know about the regulations, even though you haven't taken your flight review yet. I guess in one sense, this is sort of like being a kamikaze pilot, the kind of pilot that gets to do all this bragging ahead of time. So take a look at our special offer on the Flight Review Interactive E-Learning course. It's a perfect course for flight review prep or if you're a, rough, a rusty pilot or just a pilot looking to maintain a high standard of knowledge.